to all of you, so many familiar faces who have been here today to watch these presentations. This is Michaela Edwards, and she's going to present to us her final GSP presentation. I'll let her introduce herself again and, and provide the title of her paper, but just a couple of reminders. Once again, there is a question and answer session at the end, so we just ask that you hold those questions until the conclusion of the presentation. Michaela will invite you and open the floor if you have any thoughts or things that you'd like to ask or share. Also, uh, we are going to be breaking for lunch after this piece, so you can feel free to help, help yourself. There are some light refreshments outside. Please enjoy and have anything that you'd like. However, if you do want a little bit more of a filling lunch, the dining hall is open and available, so you can scoot up there. Our afternoon session is going to begin at 1 p.m. sharp. We've stayed on schedule until now, so I'm going to try to regain that schedule um, back at 1 p.m. So please, if you are interested in coming for the afternoon sessions, just plan on being here by 1. So if you wouldn't mind, put your hands together for Michaela Edwards. <laughs> Hello. Okay, so today, me, Michaela Edwards, I'm going to be presenting my project that I've been working on for over a semester, and it's called Online Shopping for Life, Combating Internet Sex Trafficking on a Global Scale. So first I'd like to just show you what questions I'll be answering today with my presentation. A bit of an overview, if you will. So why sex trafficking? Why the internet? What is going on in China, Venezuela, and Colorado? And where do we go from here? So first, why did I choose this project? Ever since I was little, I wanted to be involved in a career path that would help me or allow me to help other people, and whether this be as a doctor or an attorney. Additionally, crime has always intrigued me, which is why I like to watch true crime and podcasts such as those. Um, and, I, and I like to look from the outside in, and this is essentially what I can do with my project, is kind of look at it from an insider pers perspective at this point. Additionally, I have a bit of personal experience with this issue, as when I was a sophomore, my number was actually posted on Craigslist, and I had to change my number as a result because of the nature of the calls and texts and things that I got. And so yeah, while I was not sex trafficked by any means, it was a bit upsetting in that same fashion. Okay, so what is sex trafficking? I have made my own working definition based on several other journals and definitions from the dictionary. So what I have this thus far is sex trafficking is the act of either a pimp, John, madame, or other person using force, fraud, or coercion to cause a commercial sex act. And a commercial sex act involves an exchange for an item of value. So this is involved in prostitution, pornography, and sexual performances. So while it is a component of sex trafficking, it in itself is not sex trafficking. Currently, there are 4.5 million people around the world in trapped in forced sexual exploitation, and there are 2 million children sexually exploited every year globally. Because many cases go unreported, these numbers are believed to be much higher, and this is all according to the Child Advocacy Center of Lapeer County. Furthermore, Daniel Steele, the vice sergeant of the Denver police, claimed that there are more people enslaved today than any other time in human history. So just think about that for a minute and let that settle in. Sex trafficking is widespread and it violates basic human rights, and the consequences can be political, social, demographic, and health related. Furthermore, Globalization has encouraged the growth of this industry, so as a major theme in this class that we took, globalization is involved in many things, including this industry, as it is a large, rapidly growing component of transnational crime, as you will see in this presentation. So why did I choose the internet to focus on? I basically, the development and evolution of the internet has always been incredibly fascinating to me. It is interesting to see how it affects such an ancient crime such as sex trafficking. So as the internet evolves, it affects other industries as well. And it's just really interesting because sex trafficking has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And just to see how the internet has also ins inserted itself into this. Further, there's very little research to date on, the, on sex trafficking specifically on the internet. So while there's information about sex trafficking on its own, it's not speci specifically like focused on the internet as my presentation is. So I wanted to involve myself in this groundbreaking research. Okay, so I just want to clarify that I will be talking about women specifically and children, not just not all genders for victims. While there are victims of all genders, it's important to realize that I just want to focus on women and children. And so without further ado, I'll break into my regions. So first I'd like to talk about China. And I'm gonna give you some brief victimology. So 
Generally, victims include women looking for work and unable to speak English very well. Additionally, North Korean refugees because of their status as illegal, undocumented migrants in China. South and North American, African, Chinese, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laos, and Myanmarian women are also trafficked in China because most of these regions are neighboring countries or they're involved with China through connections globally. Yet most young girls are from Vietnam, Russia, and Mongolia, as these are neighboring countries. And most foreign victims that are sold in China are brought there because they have been looking for a better life. So they're from poorer countries and they want to find better lives in this country but find themselves stuck in sex trafficking. Finally, young girls interested in luxury gifts are also victims. So how did we get here? Basically, the one child policy led to a great gender gap, as you can see in this graph. So the red is, are the men, the yellow is the women. And so this has just grown a lot over the years. And this has led to a great gender imbalance which led to a demand for brides. So this is mostly in rural areas, cities, smaller towns on the eastern seaboard in China. And this is according to the Global Slavery Index. And so this lack of eligible wives has led to elevated dowry prices in areas that still enforce dowries in China. And those places still do exist. So sometimes it's cheaper for men to just buy a foreign wife, such as on a mail order bride website. Further, human traffickers are attracted to the profitable nature of the foreign bride trade. So while foreign brides and mail order brides sometimes choose to get, get into that industry of their own accord, some people, some sex traffickers will take women and sell them against their will. So that's caused a major issue. Finally, political instability is another major issue as brokers will facilitate women's travel to China, selling them or exploiting them upon arrival and also extreme disparities in income level by region. That's another source of an issue here. Okay, so how prevalent is this issue in China? In 2016, 3.8 million people were living in conditions of modern slavery, specifically just in China. And in that same year, 435 individuals were convicted for sex trafficking. So if you think about it, there's several victims per convicted individual. So if you take 435 multiplied by how many victims per individual, that's a pretty big number. And just to show you how big that number is, here, this graph shows you about 435 dots, which happens to be the same number of people in this image. As you might recognize, this is the number of members of the US, in the US House of Representatives. So it's pretty shocking. And these people are mostly trafficked, if they're trafficked out of China, it's into the United States, Europe, Australia, other parts of Asia, and the former Soviet Union. Okay, so what's happening exactly? How are people being trafficked? Traffickers will use fraudulent job opportunities to lure foreign women into China. So again, the desperate women looking for jobs and looking to get out of their current situation, they find themselves victim as they contact traffickers who are offering jobs. And traffickers will also threaten, coerce, drug, and abduct victims. So they use other means as well. The Chinese women are often transported outside of their country. So... They can be lured to the United States, for example, and one major way that they are is through WeChat, which is a popular messaging service in China. It's similar to WhatsApp, basically, and so people in the United States will contact Chinese women through this app and encourage them to come to the United States, and it's on false premises, so basically, they'll trick them. Additionally, smugglers will control those smuggled through debt bondage. I've kind of described this, but basically, people who want to come to other countries they will have to use smugglers to get them there, and the smugglers will say, okay, you owe me for these traveling expenses, and so now you're gonna have to pay me back through prostitution, for example, or working in brothels. And so the women are not being paid, they're giving their money directly to the smugglers. And another shocking fact is that Chinese smuggling organizations are often helped by the Chinese government, as their officials are often bribed, especially in Southern China. Yet corruption has even, even been indicated in the Americas, as smugglers offer money to individuals involved in the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Further, mail-order bride websites are also popular in China. As I've described before, this, this demand for brides has led to many people searching for cheaper options, such as women being advertised online. Another source of an issue here is the compensating dating theme. So this is similar to the whole sugar daddy idea that's pretty popular in the United States, where men will offer money and luxury gifts to young girls in return for companionship and sex. Yet the issue is even greater than that. Many of these girls are not 
trying to get these memes through their own will. Basically, for example, police in China found pimps operating online using the internet to locate clients interested in compensated dating their girls. So it's not always their choice to be sugar babies. They just want, like, the traffickers will use them for that purpose. Another issue are the massage parlors in the United States. So once people are coerced to come to the United States and traffickers get a hold of them, they will sell them from massage parlors, so such as this one here in this picture. And often they're advertised from these parlors on Backpage.com, which you will hear a lot about in this presentation. Mm -hmm. It's similar to Craigslist. It's where advertisements can be posted. And it's been since shut down, but I'll get into that in a bit. Okay, so some specific cases. In 2009, police operations against compensated dating took off in China, leading to Chief Inspector Cheng Qiming interviewing around 100 girls just in, China, in Hong Kong alone involved in this illegal practice. In 2008, police raided two such syndicates, finding 10 young girls whom the syndicates beat into compliance, forcing them to follow certain rules. So like I've said, compensated dating is not always consensual, and this just comes to show that. And then throughout 2009, the police arrested 22 individuals in relation to compensated dating offenses, including pimps operating online, as well as such syndicates. I read another article, and this is where these mugshots come from. All these individuals were involved in this situation. Basically, there was an international human trafficking operation tied to po prostitution in massage parlors all over Florida. According to the article from the TC Palm, a nine-month-long investigation involving multiple agencies took place that revealed how two women, at least 100 men, and several spas were involved in an international prostitution ring. Officers found advertisements offering sexual services posted by spa owners on Backpage.com. The investigation revealed that victims came to the United States with promises of legitimate jobs awaiting them, only to find themselves trapped in sexual exploitation. None of the victims were allowed to leave the spas on their own as they lived in the spas, did not have their own vehicle, and spoke Mandarin and Cantonese, not English. So as I said before, those who can't speak English are especially at risk because they have no way of communicating their situation to outsiders. And there was another article that I read from the Press Herald that explained how a Chinese, a Chinese couple ran a sex trafficking ring in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont from 2016 to 2018. The couple coerced women to travel to the United States from China using WeChat. Once in the United States, the couple controlled the women's movements by depriving them of food, documents, clothing, room keys, and other items, isolating them in rented homes or hotels. Through these means, they effectively were able to force the women into prostitution. And the defendants also employed people outside of Maine to advertise the women on Backpage.com. So it's a bit of a similar theme. Okay, now we'll talk about Venezuela. So the victimology. Most victims include poor, jobless Venezuelan women without food, housing, and security. The women are often desperate for jobs and have a family to provide for. And also, some of these women might, may migrate into Colombia looking for jobs so they can send money back to their families. These women are especially at risk. Finally, there are children living in the streets with limited or no parental supervision who find themselves abducted and brought into the sex industry. How did we get here? Most of the problem comes from a crisis that began in 2010 under Hugo Chavez that has its roots in the oil reserves in Venezuela. As Hugo Chavez encouraged a reliance on oil for the majority of earnings from exported goods. With the influx of oil money, the government created social programs. But when the oil prices dropped in 2014, these programs were scaled back, causing many Venezuelans to struggle. Additionally, since 2012, inflation began to rise steadily in the country. And now Venezuela has the highest rate of inflation globally. And so this graph here kind of shows you that. So the green bars are the oil revenue over the years, and the, the line shows you inflation. So here we are in 2016. Okay, so many individuals were forced into extreme poverty by this crisis, and they began, became vulnerable to human trafficking, as many were lured into urban areas with the promise of higher earnings only to be abducted. Thus, lack of jobs, food, housing, and security has increased the vulnerability of women in the country. So for the prevalence of this issue, it's hard to find, specifically in Venezuela, as I will get into in a bit, I wanted to focus on the internet, and Venezuelan women are not necessarily trafficked out of Venezuela on the internet, but in other countries. And so it's hard to find the exact number, and again, this plays into the whole idea that there's very little research on this subject. Okay, so what's happening? How is this happening? 
girls are being posted on Zona Divas, according to Mexico News Today. And that, this is similar to the whole back page idea. Basically, individuals can be posted on this website and sold through it. Further, traffickers will sell children through encrypted messaging services like WhatsApp, social media platforms, and the dark web. All right, so some specific cases. This woman here is, Fabi is Evelyn Fabiona N., who was arrested in 2018 for the human trafficking of young South American girls, as she was found to be the alleged administrator of Zona Divas. Fabiona N. lured young Venezuelan women into Mexico by promising them jobs, but instead of providing them with legitimate jobs, she forced them to provide sexual services upon their arrival as a means of covering the cost of their transportation. Again, this is a form of debt bondage. On April 17, 2018, 10 girls, mostly from South America, were rescued from the sex trafficking ring, and four women in charge of caring for the girls in Mexico City were detained. There was another article which described the progress that the federal police and the general attorney's office in Mexico City have made in dismantling the international network of sexual exploitation that was, that was facilitated by the website. Three women and four men are accused of luring girls into Mexico, and one of those men is the, that pictured here, and transporting them to Mexico City dealing with their, and dealing with their international financial operations. Furthermore, 1,000 girls from several countries have been saved as a result of this three-year investigation, and it was three years as of 2018. And this includes 32 victims who were sexually exploited on zonadivas.com. So it's a pretty prevalent cause of, of sex trafficking in Venezuela. Okay, and so this one will hit a little closer to home for most of us. So Colorado. So for the victimology, we have all races, genders, and ages, according to Detective Elizabeth Reed, who I have the pleasure of interviewing. She is a detective that works specifically in sex trafficking in her department in Colorado Springs. And she said, most, we have all sorts of victims, as this picture represents, but most of them are female. In fact, 79% of cases in Colorado in 2018 involved women. And most of the foreign victims are of Chinese descent. How did we get here? Our location along I-25 is a major issue, as I will describe later. Additionally, our location near the border of Mexico could also lead to victims coming from Mexico. So this kind of ties into the whole globalization idea. If victims are coming into Mexico from Venezuela and being sold out of there, it's possible they come into Colorado as well because of our proximity. Okay, so prevalence. In 2016, 70% of trafficking cases were related to sex trafficking in Colorado, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline um, website. And in 2018, this percentage of trafficking cases related to sex increased by 3%. In Colorado Springs alone, according to Detective Reed, she sees about 30 to 50 cases per year. Yet again, the unreported cases are rampant, so it's hard to put an exact number on this. She also explained how many of the victims, or most of the victims in the Colorado Springs area are trafficked on the internet rather than on the streets. So this just shows you how much of an issue it is just specifically here. Okay, so what's happening in Colorado? So we have Backpage.com. As I have said, it's a major issue, especially just in the United States alone, but specifically in Colorado. And I will show you a clip that describes that a little bit more in a minute. Previously, it was Craigslist. So people were being posted on Craigslist. But once that was shut down, Backpage gained popularity by a lot. And um, since Backpage was shut down in 2017, 300 similar sites have popped up. So it's decentralized and just grown. And that was 300 similar websites as of when I talked to Detective Reed, which was several months ago. So you can only imagine where we're at now. And I-25, as I explained before, is another source of the issue because many traffickers will transport victims between states to avoid detection by police and to offer customers the feeling of purchasing new exotic sex. So even though people are only being trafficked within the United States, potentially, it gives them the idea that they're getting new victims because they're being transported within different states. And massage parlors, another issue. As I've explained before, Many Chinese victims come to the United States and are trafficked out of these parlors, especially in Colorado. It's another major issue. It's just a front, and yeah, you don't even want to know what goes on behind the closed doors. And so this can show you again globalization, the effects of it as Chinese victims come to Colorado even. Okay, so now we're going to get into some specific 
state police. So there was a nationwide anti-trafficking operation that took place in 2015 and was incredibly successful, especially in Colorado. In Colorado and Wyoming alone, authorities rescued 20 victims between 13 and 17 years old, arrested seven pimps, and took 40 customers who bought sex into custody. For this operation, authorities concentrated on the internet to find the victims, customers, and pimps, scanning internet advertisements searching for underage individuals. So an investigator would respond to the ad, and a meeting would be set up. The other authorities would then monitor from adjoining ho hotel room, infiltrating the room after the deal was made official. So they would arrest those selling. And this is what this picture represents. Okay, and then these pictures are from the following clip that is from a documentary on Netflix, which follows the stories of three mothers and their daughters. This is the United States. There's no possible way this is true. I sent her out with one of her friends and she didn't come back. The next thing you know, boom. She brought her into a live hotel. It was like shopping on Amazon. You're just a product. Well, the most popular internet site for escorts is called Backpage.com, where authorities say underage girls are sold for sex. Backpage is the Walmart of human trafficking. It's an incredibly profitable business. We will never be the family we were before she was sold on that website. We need someone to give us a fighting chance. What if it was your daughter? How would you feel then? It's a very are these people wholesaling children in Washington State or not? I'd like to meet a member of the judiciary or a member of Congress that thinks that status quo is satisfactory. I'd like to call the CEO of Backpage, uh, Carl Ferrer. I've never seen anything like that. What are they hiding? This hearing is adjourned. There is a question as to what kind of society to tolerate sexual trafficking in children. That is an affront to everything that we believe. I want my daughter to hold her head high and know that none of this was her fault. I am Jane Doe. I am Jane Doe. It's time for us all to stand up and be strong. I am Jane Doe. in this clip were known as JSMA and Jane Doe were all sex trafficked and sold on Backpage so obviously their parents and themselves were very upset by this and so they decided to sue Backpage okay so now we've come to the conclusion section what do we know based on this research first of all further research is needed as there's very little to date as I've said before and as all of my sources mention and then in the end Backpage was Catch-22. So this might be contrary to what many people think, but based on that clip especially. But I'd like to start by saying clearly there were many aspects of the website's management that were problematic. In fact, investigations mentioned in this film revealed that Backpage.com actually assisted traffickers, playing an active role in the trafficking of children, such as those mentioned here. They offered instructions to potential traffickers, such as don't advertise in time in increments of 15 minutes and they edited out words indicative of young people being trafficked, such as Amber Alert or Fresh. Yet, two thirds of the girls mentioned in I Am Jane Doe were found because of Backpage.com. In one case, the mother found her daughter on Backpage and recognized the ad and brought it to the police and she was found and tracked down because of that. Another girl, a police officer found her ad and was able to track her down because of that. So, a little interesting. Furthermore, I talked to Detective Reed about the issue, and she discussed how the seizure of Backpage.com by the Department of Justice has affected sex trafficking on the internet. Within an hour and a half of the shutdown, new websites were being created, which allowed traffickers to advertise victims with little ability to detect from where, so it's hard to trace these ads. Now, as I mentioned before, there are three, over 300 similar sites. The detective claimed that this means that the shutdown of Backpage backfired for investigators, as they were previously able to work with administrators of the website to 
to arrest customers and traffickers. But now they lack that centralized location for ads that Backpage provided. Furthermore, while Backpage honored subpoenas and warrants, offering up evidence to investigators, new pages with international servers can completely disregard such demands. And now the detectives unit must work tirelessly to monitor new websites. Further, I found out that the internet must be monitored more closely for advertisements involved in sex trafficking, as that's how so many have been able to slip under the covers and like sell children without many people noticing, except the buyers. Finally, poverty is a major factor in sex trafficking cases, as we've seen in Venezuela and China specifically, as females often turn to unreliable individuals for jobs, only to be turned into a sex slave. They're just that desperate. Okay, so before I dive into my own proposed solutions, I think that we should look at this, the Exodus Road and Cyber Operations Center, as these are great models to consider for proposed solutions. So the Exodus Road currently operates in India, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and the United States. And it's just to find those victims of trafficking, of all kinds of human trafficking. And they can help arrest traffickers. And specifically, the Cyber Operations Center provides funds, gear, technology, and staff to help investigators in sex trafficking cases that involve the internet. The cyber initiatives operate with one goal, to quickly and efficiently uncover human trafficking so that it can be stopped. The cyber operations consist of cyber investigations and team management, and the organization's data analyst at the Cyber Operations Center in Colorado manages these endeavors. With advanced technology, the organization has the ability to monitor the internet for evidence of human trafficking. <coughs> and it also monitors evidence on the dark net as well, which is kind of interesting and important. And Kelly Allen from the Exodus Road website described how the cyber investigations work using data scraping tools to access data about traffickers online and use this data to find and arrest the traffickers. The Cyber Operations Center is also used to support teams of investigators in the field by monitoring the covert devices that they carry. So far, the Exodus Road has trained five Latin American investigators who are un working undercover and in cyber forensic. So not only do they work with their own um, with their own employees, but they also train others in other countries so that they can work for themselves. So out of 196 human trafficking cases in Colorado Springs specifically, over a two year period, the group has helped 45 individuals. And that's pretty impressive. It's a pretty great success rate, honestly. So now, what are our proposed solutions? What did I come up with? For one, well, actually, I have two types of solutions. One of them is prevention. So how are we going to prevent this from happening? And then the other is what do we do once people are trafficked to help mitigate these issues? So for, proposed, for prevention, we need to, first of all, educate. And as Daniel Steele, the vice sergeant of the Denver police said, awareness must be raised. Because many victims don't know what they're getting into. They don't know who they're talking to online. They don't realize that there's such a great danger associated with that. So we need to educate victims or potential victims and help stop this issue. Further, we need to offer teenagers more accessible information on healthy relationships. As based on this documentary I watched called Tricked on Netflix, there were several, there were several former victims of sex trafficking that spoke out and explained how their pimps acted as if they were their boyfriends, using the boyfriend in approach basically and buying them dinner and taking care of them only to later sell them as sex slaves. So it's important that girls can recognize these signs and like understand a healthy relationship from one that could end in them becoming sex slaves. We also need to ensure that social media platforms be granted the authority to verify individuals' identities. And this was actually proposed by Detective Reed. And essentially it's important that we know who's going online and who's going missing and have their exact identities so we can give the evidence to the police. For example, Amelia, another former sex slave from the Trick documentary, explains her experience meeting a woman on MocoSpace, which was another platform for social media, and this woman tricked her into sex slavery, taking her to a pimp. Amelia had no clue what she was getting into when she began talking to this woman. Further, from this, de from this documentary, Detective Chris Bauman from the Las Vegas Police Force elaborated on pimps' use of MocoSpace Facebook and other platforms to meet girls. So those platforms have only increased since this documentary was made and they've changed and adapted 
to further help traffickers as the pimps could chat with victims on these platforms and coerce them into the sex trafficking trade. <coughs> so as I mentioned before, Detective Reed suggested these solutions um, so that we can have, we can seize records and determine what kind of ID card <coughs> victims provide. So we have more information on who's on the websites. We also need to improve conditions for the jobless by helping them find secure jobs in a safe manner. So they're not so desperate that they go to sex traffickers to find them jobs only to be sold into the trade again. Okay, so now post-trafficking solutions. We need to improve technology, such as providing police, the police force with data scraping tools such as the Cyber Operations Center has. And we need to train investigators as the Exodus Road has so that all, all regions of the world can help fight their issues and we don't have to step in necessarily. We also need to maintain a website similar to Backpage. So this is contrary to many people's belief, but this website will centralize all ads and make it easier for the police to, to work with the website to find traffickers. And so then they can also honor subpoenas and warrants. Finally, we need to dedicate more resources towards the issue as this is a major issue all over the world. For example, in China, as I've mentioned before, sex trafficking is a prolific <coughs> issue, yet laws and campaigns fail to address it as such. They devote precious resources instead to police raids of entertainment establishments and punishment of sex workers. So this is kind of contrary to what we're fighting against, but basically those in China will attack the easier targets, those working consensually in the sex trade. But in reality, they need to be donating more resources towards the larger issue at hand, which is those being trafficked. Also, Venezuela is currently ranked as a tier three country according to US government's 2018 trafficking in persons report. This is the lowest tier meaning that Venezuela has done very little to combat the issue. In fact, the US Department of State noted specifically that Ven the Venezuelan government has done nothing beyond recognizing the issue. On the other hand, Colorado is an excellent example of appropriate funding. While we need more, they have done a great job with anti-sex trafficking efforts, as there is a department dedicated only to this issue as I have described before, which is what Detective Reed works for, and the Cyber in Operations Center is also located in Colorado. So they've donated abundant resources. So that is all for my proposed solutions, but I hope that we can move forward from this and work towards solving the issue. And while we can't necessarily individually make some grand gestures such as providing the police force with data scraping technology or other tools, we can certainly educate others and increase awareness. Further, we can also donate to the police force to get these needs. So thank you, that is all. <laughs> Now. Um, when you talked about raising awareness, who do you think like in our society is responsible for doing that? Like when you research these, you, you talk about like the police too, I guess. I mean, the police have further battles to fight, but I think it's important that the media take this on. I think that one of the major problems with this issue is it's it's not broadcast enough. People don't understand the severity of it, and they that's why there's so little research on the topic here. So it's important that the media take this on and present what is actually going on in the country, all over the world, really. Do you think there'd be any other consequences if everyone had to be verified as an identity on social media? I mean, it takes away anonymity, which I think a lot of people hold dear to them. So that could cause some, raise some issues with that, with freedom of expression and things like that. But in the end, I don't see a major issue with that. I think it's a good idea, honestly, because it, it contributes to the issue because people don't know the true identity of who's online and who's causing these terrible acts. Yeah. Is Doha Girls the same as Backpage just in Mexico or is it like something different? It's kind of different. Well, Backpage is all encompassing as it was before it shut down and it advertises, you know, jobs and I don't know if you've ever been on Craigslist, but it's very similar and so you, you could find all sorts of things, not just sex, whereas Zona Divas is targeted specifically towards escort services and it has some illegal uh, things going on too. Layla? Um, so how are people who engage in sex work consensually at risk for trafficking or is there a difference for them? I didn't research specifically on those in consensual sex trafficking or consensually in the sex trade, but I think 
I think they could be a lot more at risk because they're they are involved in a risky lifestyle such as this and while it's no one's fault whatsoever it just it exposes them to the individuals responsible as well mm-hmm. so they're working side by side with those who are sex trafficked Patty you mentioned that like a lot of people are being like sex, sex trafficked out of this country like just all these toddlers and squads um is this like a pretty common So it's really interesting, actually, because the the sex trafficking thing I mentioned before in Florida, that was brought to light because of individuals who went into these parlors and recognized these signs. You know, it looked like the women were living out of the sex or out of the massage parlors, which they were. And so, you know, seeing clothing on the ground and seeing beds like half made or whatnot in the parlors, that is a major sign. The women are being forced and isolated in these areas, and it's important to take these matters to the police and to notify them and that's what happened in the florida case and it brought a long and nine month investigation and brought many individuals to justice so i think that's really important to talk to the police about and to just notify people when you see signs such as that yeah when you were talking with the detective was there any kind of opinion that she had about impacting the other side of the equation for dms like just shutting down the dm port like there consequences or harder consequences? She actually didn't talk about that, but through my research, I found that Colorado imposes a great, a very hefty sentence on those that buy sex, and that is a great way to go about this. I think that's another reason I think Colorado is a great model to look off of, even though it's prolific here. We do, we do prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law, and so that's, it helps for sure, and I think we're Colorado specifically is doing a great job and we need to continue that in other places as well. Just increase the penalties so that people will not necessarily get involved in that. Can you find any other states that you can compare against where they don't prosecute or something when their statistics are higher than ours? Well, I mean, I didn't really look at other states, but the other countries certainly. So as I mentioned before, Venezuela has done very, very, very little to combat the issue at hand. And so certainly... There, it, while you can't really put a number on it because it's so um, underreported, they have a very, very high rate of people leaving the country and being trafficked. And so certainly I think to a higher extent than Colorado. And that in comparison, they have no sentence for those mm-hmm. buying sex or selling it. So I think that's a good comparison. Um, and then I know like earlier in your research, you're really interested in the dark net. So actually, it was pretty early on in my research that I interviewed the detective, and she said, in reality, they have had very little time, her department alone has had very little time to focus on such a big animal such as the dark net. They have to focus on the smaller things, and they're already so consumed by it. It's, there's very little research. There's very little research, because there's already so much to look into just with the surface net. So I really did want to look into the dark net, but it was nearly impossible for me, because there was no research whatsoever. So while there's very little research in where I was already looking, the dark net was nearly impossible. And so I thought it would be better to tackle something a little bit easier with my research. What really is the dark net? <laughs> the dark net, it, it's basically the, the web, like, so you think of it like an iceberg. The internet is an iceberg. And the surface net is just the little tip. And everything underneath is the dark web. And, or there's two sections. There's the dark web and, um, the deep web. And so the it's it's a part of the internet that you can only access using like Tor, which is the onion router or some up something of the like. And it, it basically provides people with anonymity so they can't be tracked. And this is a place where drugs are sold, you know, there's a bunch of crazy stuff going on. There's people <laughs> advertising as hitmen. You can buy pretty much anything on the dark net. And so while I didn't do a bunch of research on it, I did find there are some cases where people have been sold on it. So, I mean, a bunch of crazy things are being 
facilitated on the dark net because it's an it's anonymous. Mm-hmm. Clip on the student answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can answer. Yeah, I'm saying it's probably hard to answer. Um, so in that documentary, where the guy from the back back page, page um, did he not show up? Oh, the the, the the uh, man CEO. responsible. The CEO didn't. He show did up. it. He didn't. They and had to get a warrant. The lawsuit then. Oh, they had to get a warrant. So it took two years for these wi- for the moms to finally get the website shut down. So it took a long time. It was a really interesting documentary because it went through all the legalities of it and talked about the CDA, the Communications Decency Act, which basically um, allows websites to hide behind huh. it and be protected, which is why the, qu- the case took so long to solve oh, because you know through this act, websites can't be charged for third party users what they post on it. Oh. And so it, it was a really interesting situation. But the guy didn't show up. No. But they, they ended up having to get a warrant for him. And so it was, it was bad. He show, showed up eventually. Yes, he was arrested. So, um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Great.